Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best of the best to help you scale your business from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today's guest is a special one. His name is Andreas Cliff, the co-founder and CEO at Corti. Andreas, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mike. Pleasure. So, and I'm sure that uh, everyone is excited to get to know more about you and, and the story of Corti. So uh, let us know who, who is Andreas. I'll try not to disappoint then. Um, <laughs> yeah, who is, who, who am I really? That's such a big question to start out with, right? You've already heard exactly. it before. Uh, yeah, so I am from Denmark, Copenhagen. Uh, Mom, Swedish, dad's Danish. Um, lived in a bunch of countries, but um, I guess this journey starts uh, back in 2010 when I thought I was going to be a banker and uh, went to, to uni and sort of figured out that wasn't my path. And in, yeah, in 2010, ended up founding what would be my first healthcare startup. Got it. And um, I guess the reason healthcare has such a draw on me is that I grew up in a family where chronic disease was dinner table news. So my family, people were doctors or nurses or uh, dentists mm -hmm. or surgeons. And on top of that, we had my mom, among others, who was who was chronically ill my entire childhood. So I think, think healthcare was a major part of the conversation at the dinner table. And what to me seemed so obvious was like how smart and lucky we were, <clears throat> how lucky we were to have so many smart doctors in, in Denmark. Right. But sadly, getting a hold of them and having the adequate time with them was hard, even here. And I guess that sort of trajectory and that sort of conundrum of like, what do we do when we think we have the, the best op opportunities and, and we still lack access? What do we do about it? And that sort of propelled me into healthcare in 2010, built a company Amazing. called Ovivo, Ovivo and uh, that was sort of the start of the journey. That sounds uh, that sounds amazing, and that's also a good uh, connection point. I've shared recently on on LinkedIn that um, 2021 has been our best year ever. Um, but on personal side, uh, Elf was also uh, art, so I got diagnosed with uh, autoimmune disease, so a chronic one, uh, low uh, thyroid disease. So and and that is one of the reasons why I want to cover more healthcare uh, scale ups in in the show in in twenty two. So I completely relate to what you just said about uh, your mom and uh, and your family. So, but getting to know more about Corti. So what what Corti does? Corti is uh, my second attempt at building a specific product around. Uh, healthcare professionals and getting access to them. And, and what Cordy does is it's a machine learning technology uh, built, uh, built by some, some really, really brilliant colleagues of mine that allows us to listen in when a patient and a medical professional is having a consultation. And I think a lot during COVID have had these experiences sitting on a, a, a digital platform like we are right now and having consultations or maybe exactly. calling 112 or 911 or just going to their doctor and still coming back thinking like, what happened? Did I get the right kind of treatment? And when right. they left the doctor, uh, the doctor actually ended up spending a ton of time just at the keyboard, right? And that's right. sort of what we try to fix at, at, at Cordy. We, we want to reduce the, the, the time doctors have to spend at a keyboard, the amount of risk that doctors have to take and try to help use that data with machine learning during the consultation to ask the right questions and ensure the right kind of treatment is offered. So it's sort of an, an, an uh, a Jarvis, Iron Man's Jarvis, just for doctors. Right, kind of the, not only a personal assistant because it also helps with with data. And uh, I'm sure that there is a lot of uh, insights that it could bring later on uh, for the patient doctor journey or experience journey. Right. So sounds sounds really. Uh, interesting. And, and for the ones who are uh, listening, just to understand where you are in terms of the, the stage of growth, could you share some metrics um, about where you are? Sure. Uh, Cordy was founded in 16, uh, 2016. We spent the first two years uh, building it. So it's built grounds up here, patented all, all the, that jazz. 
uh, spent 19 and 20 in medical trials proving it works. And uh, that, that was our first commercial year during COVID-19. Uh, today, we're, we're 100 people, roughly. Uh, raised our, thank you. Raised our Series A's last summer was uh, $27 million. And before that, we raised the seed in, I think, 17 was uh, roughly $5 million. Got it. Sounds amazing. So around 100 people. So in, in terms of um, healthcare, sometimes the, the metrics uh, that relate are a little bit different. It is also a different time to develop or to scale up um, compared to a typical SaaS business. So to raise a Series A, the same kind of rules apply. So to have kind of 1 million ARR plus or the metrics are a little bit different. No, absolutely the same. I, okay. uh, we don't get that same playbook. So, okay. Same playbook. <laughs> uh, okay, sounds sounds great. So uh, usually we ask this question at the end of the show, but this time we are asking at the beginning of the show because sometimes we feel that there is so much more to talk, so much more to extract. And if we would ask this uh, in the beginning, so if you would have the opportunity to um, just meet yourself for, for a coffee at the beginning of Corti six years ago, or even 10 years ago, as you said in your own introduction, what advice would you offer to your younger self? Be patient. <laughs> and and that, sound, that sounds a little bit, bit boring, but I think it, it, it stems from your, your questions uh, from before. Like what's the playbook and what does it take to build a healthcare startup? Right. I think there is a trade-off here. So you can go build your, your SaaS company or your B2B or B2C company. And, and I think there, that's a wide space, obviously, covering right there, trying to generalize a little bit. But if you look at your SaaS B2B startup versus your healthcare SaaS, yeah. um, this will most probably be more complicated. And that's because not only is the same rules applying, you still need the revenue, you still need the growth, but the login effects of actually succumbing sort of the initial barriers to entry are harder. Yeah. especially if you want to build close to end customer or inpatient value creation. So that means like if you want to get close to like where the magic happens, then mm -hmm. it's highly regulated, right? And to play in a highly regulated space with high earnings usually means big competence has an advantage because they have uh, more lawyers per sales rep, uh, more infrastructure per sales rep, more right. money per sales rep. That means it's like it's easier for them to stitch together better offers that's highly com uh, uh, com uh, uh, compatible to whatever we could come with, making the entry barrier quite high. And I think as as a, as a guy like me who is not only driven by I want to build a massive massive company that really has impact, I also want to uh, make a good business case out of it for for um, my my stakeholders. Right? I yeah. think during the past since sixteen to now, it's been so many moments uh, where. It all looked grim and hard. Uh, GDPR, just to name one, came out of the blue, was really hard and was very, very stifling for a data startup in Europe to even succumb, especially when we were looking at critical patient healthcare data. Um, right. but, but I would ultimately think that if you're building towards a future outcome and a future scenario that you are very certain will define our reality in the future. And I think what we built for was the idea that in the future, healthcare is going to be digitized and in that digital future, mm -hmm. we're going to distribute access to healthcare. And that will increase mistakes. It will increase risks on the providers of healthcare. And we can be there to provide trust and re reduce risk. And I think that's what we built for. And luckily, COVID-19 and other big trends proved that we might be onto something. Yeah, it's uh, the pandemic uh, in some cases. And I think this is clearly the case has been accelerating the digital transformation process um, around healthcare. So we needed uh, this kind of tools and this new way uh, of doing things in the industry. So that's quite nice. And um, what do you see? I, I see that you are also um, a strong evangelist for AI, especially in the Nordics. Uh, you are also sharing some organizations in, in that space. Uh, how do you see AI playing a role in the future of healthcare and, uh, and of course, at Corti? So, so Cordy, that, that part is, is way easier. We're uh, uh, AI native, so we're AI first. We, we spent years building grounds of all the technology, so we're mm -hmm. not leveraging just your average third party IPA, like API tech from, from Google or, or Microsoft, uh, where we've actually built it ourselves. So inherently to what we offer, it's not necessarily as much sort of the 
the platform, the SaaS freemium thing, that's not really us. We're an engine that you plug into your consultations. And what we'll do is we'll reduce the amount of time your doctors, your mm -hmm. nurses, your dispatchers spends doing admin, doing risk management, doing quality assurance. And I think, think that the, the more interesting version, obviously, is like, uh, how does AI then fit in healthcare? And, and, and I guess that's also how Cordy really fits, fits in healthcare, right? Yeah. Um, I think, think the, the, obviously, this is, uh, there's easy answers. Like uh, AI, uh, McKinsey has brought all these amazing reports to us the last five, seven <laughs> years on healthcare automation, uh, redeeming all these optimizations and workflows. And that, I think, is very, very real that the majority of workflows we've had historically has come from the fact that if you look at healthcare as, as a production system, especially in Europe, the classical version, if you look, go back a couple of decades of operationally managing a hospital, let's say you had a little bit of, of overflowing resources. So you, you're using a bit too much or you had a bit more capacity than you used. That was actually viewed upon intellectually as, as sort of that's your safety margin, right? Today, hospitals and healthcare systems they're getting operationalized as a part of the wider market and that means like they're being looked upon by investors as much of an investment as a power plant or a commerce company and that means that margin of error that like your buffer is all of a sudden surplus and that's getting skimmed and cut and that means healthcare today operates much more on the margins so if you go to your doctors they're they're back in 1989 a doctor would have around 20 minutes with you every time you had a consultation and if you go there today, they have like seven minutes. So there's something happened, right? And if you look on top of that, to make sure you can operate on the margin, you need to document more to reduce risk. So what happened is doctors spend tons of time uh, making sure that they're not at risk on this very, very hard job we've given them of being the mm -hmm. last resort of all healthcare expertise, but they're operating on a margin so they can't really fail. And that I think is a very hard conundrum because you and me as patients, like, like you and I both are, are are deep in, in, in the healthcare sector as, as patients I hear, we have so high expectations because we got Facebook, we got Twitter, we got <laughs> all the coolest services, we have the nicest, uh, anything for email clients and productivity optimizations, whatever it might be, we have it. And then we come to healthcare and we want to experience the same kind of convenience and quality and insights, right? Correct. So these forces, a healthcare system operating at the absolute margins, being measured at a market that looks upon it as much of a, a, an operator, a market opportunity as any other industry and professional, uh, sorry, patients who are expecting more and more. That creates a conundrum for how we keep sustainably growing the offering in healthcare while making it cheaper. And that's where I think AI comes in. I love it. Uh, and I see a movement that I'm also very passionate about, which is uh, also other doctors position themselves in a different way. So we kind of don't do 20 minutes consultations. We do 90 minutes of consultations because for instance, in my case, we need to test a lot of potential root causes, changes in diet, uh, in supplements, et cetera, et cetera. So they need much more time with the patient. And again, we are expecting this because we want our symptoms to, <laughs> to improve and we, we want to work on ourselves and we want to bring solutions to the, to the doctor. And the doctor is also usually in this case, much more open to, to new studies, to, to advice from the patient, which is something not very normal in the doctor-patient uh, relationship. Uh, and it's nice to see that uh, in one way, there are some consultations or some kind of consultation that would need to be more effective, less time, more convenient, better experience. Uh, other, that's the, the doctor also needs more time to be with the patient, right? So that's everything that's out. Um, that's some of the, the tools that the Corti can also provide to, um, to both sides of the table, right? I think, I think an interesting example of exactly that kind of analysis. And I think that's one thing we've seen is that if you have an average doctor, they would have tens of thousands of consultations during their career. And if you stack back, it's like, uh, like it's dozens of Boeing planes filled with consultations because they have so many thousands of people going through their offices during a career. Right. And if, if that's the case, right, and you have so many consultations and you start looking at like what's going on inside them, up until now, it's not been financially feasible to analyze that because you couldn't just have another doctor doing real-time second opinions because that would like double the price. It wouldn't be feasible, exactly. right? Good point. So now, now we can do that with a technology like ours 
And all of a sudden, that means we can see where shouldn't they be spending time. And a, a case in point would be uh, uh, medical prescriptions. So if you look at, and that's what of our AI can do, it can look at the conversation. So let's say you're my doctor, I'm your patient, I'm calling to get my prescription renewed. That conversation usually is quite structured. So if you look at it as one big decision exactly. tree or interaction, it's quite structured. So in that case, if it continues to be structured, it's usually a case that lends itself to a technology like ours to automate it, giving that time back to the doctor so they can spend that extra time with you about counseling you in your path as a patient. Love it. That, that's, that's a great point. And in that sense, it serves both kind of doctors, the ones who are going to position themselves in more kind of rare or emergent new diseases that of course there is not a playbook to treat those with conventional medicine. Um, and there are another kind of, of uh, consultation that we all have, including myself, that are much more by the book that can be automated. It's, uh, we know that this happened so many millions of time that if we are showing this kind of symptoms, you need to do this, this, and this. And uh, you don't need um, special expertise to help you out in, in that case. So that's, so just for, this conversation, and it's my first touch base with, with your technology, we see the huge potential um, and the uh, huge amount of applications that we can um, have for, for this technology that you guys are, are developing. So one of the issues, and, and we, we just saw that we can go for multiple use cases, and uh, this is maybe a, a good introduction for our next topic, which is much more related with something that is really important for companies to scale, which is radical focus. Um, for instance, uh, understanding very well what is our niche, what is our use case, what is our buying persona, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for instance, in your case, I, I believe that you are scaling by um, US instead of um, Europe. Uh, could you share some insights about your um, bet in terms of ICP and how you drive focus into the company and what looks like the, the upcoming years for Corti to scale up? Uh, great question, Mike. And I think to start answering that question, I think uh, I'm just going to put a pin in COVID, right? Yeah. Because if you look at Corti as sort of a bit about a future, one of the base things we believed was that more and more doctor-patient interactions would be uh, virtual. And then COVID came. So if you look at the U.S. market, roughly 0.8% of all consultations pre-COVID was virtual. And now it's about 38 to 40% wow. that has some kind of virtual uh, section of that interaction, right? Amazing. And, and it, it, it's a $4 trillion market, right? So this is a massive, massive change that happened very, very fast, right? Absolutely. And I think one of the, the things that sort of I think is key to, to growing a company is that you have a kernel of strategy or beliefs about where the market or the world is going that you're excited about. And that kernel needs to, to be applied to whatever uh, situation uh, redeems mm -hmm. itself. And I think the whole concept of rolling strategy during COVID, like the idea of incrementally always improving your strategic uh, manifestation of that kernel is key. And I think COVID proved that for the majority of companies worldwide because a 10-year plan wasn't very good if it hadn't factored that fact in, right? Oh, so, so to start answering your question, I think in, during COVID, we, we not only were we able to deliver a lot of tech to help providers test, screen, manage for COVID-19, but we also got a chance to sit down and see, okay, if everybody now has like four out of 10 interactions, that's some mm -hmm. kind of digital What's our role in that? And what will everybody else need to do to be a part of that reality? And I think what, what we found as a company is that I see tons of healthcare startups wanting to be the interface, wanting to be the platform where you call your doctor, wanting to be the mobile app where you chat or converse with the professional. And I think they're going to do a splendid job, many of them. But I think in our DNA wasn't being front and center. We wanted to serve them as they developed all these new interfaces. We didn't know which would be the best or would uh, WebMD be better than Teladoc? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I'm very sure that the doctor who's on that service delivering some kind of, of consultation will need us to help them uh, code that consultation. We can dive into what coding is, but making sure they get paid. 
making sure they're compliant, they're, they're quality assured, they're delivering the, the service they've promised, right. and they're delivering the care they need. And that's something the three sort of underlying truths RAI can, can sort of it, uh, be, be plugged in and test for all the time, fully automatic. And that redeems a ton of time to spend with the patient to deliver a better right. service. And that became crystal ultra clear for us and, and created even more focus on how do we then integrate with these providers? How do we stay out of the way of these providers? What do we do when they're doing perfect work? Should they even see AI or should AI just, should they just know we were there and they did perfect? We didn't have to intervene at all. What's the real role of augmenting uh, in this case? And, and who do we then make sure understands that in the organization? Who's our ambassadors? And what's the process of selling that? That changed a bit for us the last two years. Right. So I, I guess that's, uh, the industry is quite clear. Of course, here we, we could discuss the, um, maybe the, the sub-industries uh, around healthcare. Uh, geographies is also uh, quite clear. Maybe there is some complexity that we could discuss around state by state. Then maybe the size of the, um, of the healthcare uh, company, this is also something that might, might be prioritized. Is there any insights uh, about um, the size of companies that might be more um, open to these kind of solutions? Yeah, so so um, to be sort of that security layer, that kind of like review platform, the trust pile, whatever you want to call it for consultations and mm -hmm. doing all that grunt work, all that admin work automatically, it lends itself to uh, first off being sensitive to language. So as you can imagine, we need to understand what's being said. Exactly. And to, to do that, right. we build our speech recognition. And that means our speech recognition needs to be quite good. And to make matters worse, our speech recognition is built for dialogues with at least two people mm -hmm. talking yeah. however they want to talk. Like uh, no patient should ever be thinking, oh, oh, Cordy's in the call. I need to exactly. overpronounce <laughs> or whatever Siri-like situation we've all uh, encountered, right? So, so we have a quite challenging setup on even just getting into that conversation and delivering value. And that's why we focused on English speaking markets. So we're, we spend a lot of time in, in the US, some time in the UK and some time in Australia. And then we have our home markets here in Scandinavia. Got it. Got it. It's, it sounds clear to me. Uh, and are you seeing that uh, for the English speaking marketing markets, of course, US is always for any scale up uh, very important uh, markets, uh, but in opposition to other SaaS scale-ups, uh, healthcare has specific regulations state by state. So what are some of the issues that you, Corti needs to face in order to uh, another healthcare scale-up to, to scale up in, in the US? So we're, um, the technology we're selling is, is inherently the first kind of customers we want and can help are big healthcare organizations who have thousands of patient consultations every year that has a quite uh, a good idea about how to, like, is it phone calls, is it video calls, is mm -hmm. it actual meetings? And they have an infrastructure around that. Those companies we right now can help. Those deals tend to be larger. The sales cycle is larger. The relationship is way longer. So it creates, it needs to create way more trust. And I think one of the things we're trying to get, uh, continue to be good at, and I think what we're doing decently at is building those kind of relationships of being a trusting partner, even for very, very big, more mm -hmm. classical corporate healthcare companies. And I think that's a little bit adverse to many startups who do maybe more uh, mm -hmm. uh, bleeding edge early adopters. I think right. the real opportunity for, for data intense business models is where the biggest parts of data is accessible. And right now I see... Uh, the health, the, both the healthcare providers and the healthcare insurers who have certain volume as, as the best place to be, be creating value for us. But but yeah, the goal obviously is sifting down to smaller and smaller companies. So at, in a year's time or two or three, every healthcare startup that wants to do consultations could just uh, plug in Cordy for get, go to GitHub, figure out how to engage. And then they can have that service running automatically uh, on top of what they're doing. But But right now it's very much about these like pan US or pan English speaking markets healthcare providers. And we help first off on all of their phone calls, video calls, all the digital remote stuff. And that's inherently not state by state as much as, as, as in many other cases. Right. And kind of the um, Scandinavia has been and, and Denmark, the, um, 
kind of the pilot markets to test this out uh, before going abroad uh, and internationally to other English speaking markets. I see. That's definitely very good points. I'm still uh, thinking about it <laughs> as, we, as we speak. Right, but, and, I, and I think a note on that, right? Um, yeah. When I started building healthcare companies in 2010, uh, I come from Denmark and Denmark is known for having a great healthcare system. And we, we yeah. definitely do. But I think what we experienced over, especially Cordy's lifetime since 16 to now is that that advantage is relative in the in terms of data, right? Because we're in Denmark, like six six million people roughly, mm -hmm. and uh, six million people producing great data is great. But if you go to Beijing, or right. Shanghai, or any other Hubei province, and there are sixteen million, so six zero million people producing data, it might be twenty percent less enriched, but their sheer mass means that they quite easily catch up, right? Right. And I think that's one of the advice I'm often giving to healthcare intense healthcare startups that comes to me from Sweden or Holland or Denmark mm -hmm. or whatever home, home market. And they're like, oh, I'm going to take my home market first. And, and that obviously makes sense if you have customer access and, and use case access. But I think many healthcare startups and many European startups should be very aware of uh, the demands of delivering in the European market right now on both data legislation, privacy, infrastructure, and, and language country by country and the, the whole cultural differences is quite high. So you quite easily get stuck in home markets. And if they're not very big, I think one could worry that you, you scale too slow, at least to be a venture case. So exactly. in, in, our, in our case, we started our, our customer number two was American. Our customer number three uh, we started working with was in Australia. So I think that was a, sort of a, a premise for us. We knew if we got stuck in small Denmark, which is like a province in the U.S., uh, we would never become the kind of company we wanted to be. That's a great point, and uh, also a great insight that you shared before. It's having a certain focus to start with. Uh, that's okay to be enterprise oriented in the beginning, and then having the vision to go downstream. Um, and other way around, typically the SaaS uh, model. It happens a lot of companies also that go in the different direction, which is, as you said, acquiring the early adopters and then going. Uh, upstream. So one of the companies that I work with, Leapwork, has exactly the same kind of strategy. They started focused on completely on enterprise um, in instead of uh, going up markets st step layer by layer, um, as you just um, shared. Sounds sounds great, uh, great great points, and and definitely we should not forget what a startup and a scale up are all about. It's really um, leveraging or detecting, identifying a strong problem, a strong opportunity in the market, believing that we are able to help to solve that big problem, and positioning ourselves with a, with a solution to solve that problem uh, and solve. Uh, start solving that huge problem that is, uh, by the way, a problem that keeps growing and growing and growing in less than a decade. And uh, so speed is is critical and we need to find out what are the markets that can also help be, be, on, be on our side to achieve that kind of, um, that kind of speed. Good point. So now we, we change gears to another point that I that I love which is much more related with uh, the team the culture the um, remote work the, the the trends of talent so we know that in order to scale we need to ensure that we have the right people on on the right seats and um, not only that we need to make them a team and a culture that's that that way of bringing them together and making them to stay together uh, what are some of your insights um, scaling up the company now until uh, to 100 people? So what has been some of your lessons learned there? I think one of the things I hear people who work at Cordy say, which I, I really guard and keep on pushing, is that we have a quite frank and open uh, the format and culture where anybody can come to me and discuss anything. And I hope to be That's able great. to keep on building that kind of culture. And I, I think many CEOs sort of have all these like very high level strategies and we can sort of all echo the same things like uh, giving people purpose and interesting work and uh, impact <laughs> and people are tired of corporate <laughs> life and la, 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 right? And I think all that is, is very true. The problem is there's so many startups now to pick from, right? Exactly. So, so why, why should you choose Cordy over something else? 
I, I think what we have we have learned is that anything that isn't truly us, truly sort of at our essence, is very hard to 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 keep doing, right? And that that mm-hmm. that sounds a little bit uh, pragmatic, but I think uh, we're never going to compete with the Googles of the world on uh, beanbags and massage stools, right? It's just never going to happen. <laughs> Um, so for, for us, it was very much about like finding out what we truly want to embody every day and where we would want to work ourselves. And that's what the journey we're on as a management team is figuring out how do we, in that case, enable that more and more to stay true to what we are, to be uniquely us. And I think in, in our case, it's very much about, uh, we're not one of these companies where like, uh, we we work in it with an industry that saves people. We want to serve those people, and that's super meaningful to us. So we're not saying we're going to replace doctors. We're actually just going to amplify them. So we're here to serve them. We want to stay intellectually curious about how to do it. So we've gathered what I, what I truly believe is one of the, the, the best technical teams in Europe. And uh, we're continuously proving on research and machine learning and, and public benchmarks that we are among the global best which we can only keep doing because the, the curious minds out there who are really, really smart, mm-hmm. uh, they come here and experience that we put a high bar on it. So it's not just something we say, we screen a ton. And that's a part of creating a culture where just to get in, you're, you're through quite a lot of screening. So anybody from an office manager to an MVP, we're going to do a lot more than you'll see at many other startups. And some even find that a little bit frightening. But I think that that's sort of to, to keep protecting the talent that's there and allow them to keep being intellectually curious about how to have more impact in their role and, and as a company. And I think that's something we're doing well and there's tons of stuff we're, we're not way good enough at yet. But but the core of what I'm trying to say is that that was what was unique for us was the, uh, a realm that was open, free and, and flat that allowed intellectual curiosity and pace while still staying true to the fact that we are serving some of the most important functions in healthcare. So we can't just go around and build fast and break things. Like I hate that model. Like the, the moment you have impact on something that's important, that just doesn't work. And I don't think that's what we as a tech industry should embody anymore. So, okay. so at least for us, that, that wasn't what we wanted to be. And, and instead, we're trying to find our own voice in, in a job market that's quite crazy right now. Yeah. And this makes me remember one of the things that you have on your LinkedIn uh, that quite catched me. One of the posts that you shared when you announced that your Series A round that you are proud of having investors that are there not only to sell, but out, but, but mainly to own and to create um, a generational uh, company that could last for four decades. Um, because definitely, again, the, the why of, of Corti and, and the size of the problem and the importance of solving that problem is, is really can have an impact in, in many decades uh, ahead of time. So... Good point. And, um, and any, any lessons related to, so at this stage, when are people, you kind of need to have, I would say that the first version of, or even the second version of leadership team uh, in place. And then there is this transition into, into series B, getting to five, 10 million ARR. And so where the company will keep changing uh, a lot. And uh, as you said, uh, it's impossible to have uh, perfection in any company, but especially in a scale-up that is growing at this pace, uh, there, there is always fires. Uh, we, we, we will never be perfect. We'll have much more problems than, than solutions. And we, what we need, to, as we discussed it before, as focus, we need to pick the, the right battles at the time. Uh, because perfection is something that uh, we can't aim for. Uh, progress, uh, yes, <laughs> that we should focus um, on. But any insights about building, refining leadership teams for each stage of growth? Yeah, yeah. Uh, God knows I made a lot of mistakes. I would wish if I could go back, I could redeem. And one of them was that I think uh, as founders, you are often caught in this dilemma of if you're at least building a venture back startup is that yeah. the, the the benchmarks for companies you can compare to who found product market fit really fast or timing for, for their offering was perfect, whatever it might be, whatever industry is always the benchmark, right? So I might be a healthcare startup, but I'm still looking at helping and those guys and like just super inspired and in all, right? Uh, what what 24%, 24,000% growth in a year is like, it, it's magic, right? And, and they're, they're true, true, true artists. Um, I think one of the things I learned from my part was 
that when you incrementally know that you have some of these fires, it could be on product or it could be on sales or customer success mm-hmm. or infrastructure or HR, then you're always like really, really, really focused on solving those. And I think that sometimes stifles your your uh, your time spent on instead of forecasting, like if I solve this, then incrementally I can solve that. You should backcast way more, right? And 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 my point is, what like when you're at your B round, or A round, or C round, what do you look like? What like what's the composition of what you are? And I think just mentally making that exercise every month, like like if I was here right now and I I, I try to backcast from my B round or A round or C round, like what what do I lack right now that I should have that I will have at that point? And then starting organizationally building that way earlier than you thought you needed, if you can afford it. Absolutely. But I think cho- choosing to afford hiring more senior leadership, I think, and that's what I've experienced with my own uh, startups and money, works if you're mm-hmm. good at hiring. And with that, we can talk for length about how you become good at screening and hiring. But yeah. for earlier than you think you need, hire better leaders. Keep finding people who can grind and hustle but hire them earlier than you think you should. Absolutely. That, that's a good point. And uh, it also relates with, with the previous point. I think that's one of the lessons that I've, that I've learned is, of course, we, we have this mentality when we are scaling up that we need to double down in a specific niche. But if that niche is becoming into the saturation point that it will be difficult to keep doubling, tripling out of that niche, we need to have, again, a startup mindset to explore another niche to keep growing um, at the same pace. And the moment to find out that niche is not when the other niche is saturated, is much uh, before. And especially, as you said, it's, it's, again, getting to product market fit into that new niche. So it, it, it is better to start at least one year uh, before. And, and the same applies to what I like to call the VP 1.0, 2.0, and uh, 3.0, or even the new VP that you will need in the new structure that doesn't fit into the current structure, given the size of the company, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you need to start establishing the relationship with even with those with those people, so you you can have you can be on the same page um, before they join because then the first 90 days are critical. So they kind of need to have that pre-boarding uh, well set, right? Good point. Okay, cool. And uh, we don't want to, to make it too long, and but we could be talking for hours. Uh, but before we go, is there any specific lesson, any specific story, any specific point that you'd like to approach uh, before we go? I think for for uh, for startups, at least a, a last comment. I both think on hiring and finding product market fit and scaling sales and getting all these things right that needs to be a part of building and scaling a, a unicorn. Mm-hmm. I think what what I reflect a lot on and I hear from some of the best mentors I have is they're really good at figuring what they are not. And I see that so often in startups that uh, you might have an amazing employee who doesn't work. N- not keeping that employee is really hard. We've all been there, but if it isn't right, it's not right for either parties. If the business model is kind of working, but not really working, but there's still money in it, it, it's probably going to sting, but you need a plan and you need to move on and you need to say no. Because all the things you are not is what makes you far more than all the things you are, because there's always opportunities in startup land to build, hire, grow, scale. But what will really define, define you is all the things you said no to on the way there. And I think that's just something to keep in mind as you scale. That's a great point. Uh, thank you, Andreas, for, for this last uh, bit of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, really a, a good one. We need to have this growth uh, mindset in, 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 and not only that fixed mindset. And that's the difficult part when we should bring consistency or bring agility and, and change the page uh, to the next stage. And what got us here might not get us there. <laughs> so we need what and it's even more difficult what made us successful today might not make us successful uh tomorrow so that, that's a difficult one very true andreas thank you so much for joining us today it was really a pleasure and all the best for for courty you too and thank you for inviting me and and to you we keep bringing you the best of the best to make your journey a little bit easier scaling your business so see you soon 
and keep scaling.